Um, my talk today is where do ideas come from? It's uh, more difficult a question than you realize. And I have suggested at this late uh, time of the day that it has implications on policy, practice, pedagogy. I'm the product of a rare idea that you can study science and arts at the same time. It started by a chance encounter with this building, uh, a picture that I came across quite by chance in a public library while mugging for O levels. And I spoke to my principal about it, and wise as he was, he arranged for me an exception to study art and science at the same time. And that brought me to study architecture uh, some 40 years ago now. I just brought the average age of this room by about 10 years, I think. Um, and life has never been the same again. I, I, I see the world quite differently, and I'm acutely different, uh, aware of the different ways in which uh, uh, life is not so cut and dry. I had a deep privilege, uh, 15 years later, after architecture school, to be given a chance to study creativity, which I consider the greatest privilege and honor uh, to have uh, to study because I believe it is the most amazing human attribute that one can have. And it is a, it's a wonderful gift from God and, and it's, a, it's one of the most difficult subjects and yet the most wonderful uh, and most difficult thing to, to look at. It's easy to say this, but in fact, ideas are all around us. But it is like saying, well, knowledge is all around us. But why is it that some people have somehow greater access? They can see more ideas than others. Um, why is it that somehow some things pop out more uh, often and somehow clearer than others? Um, in other words, it is not like a truckload of ideas that somehow if you have access to the truck, then you have the truckload with you. I want to suggest that if you look closely, there are at least three ways in which you can mine um, uh, ideas. But I shan't spend too much time with it because there is an interesting underlying phenomena that I'll get to uh, in a minute. You can fish for ideas. Fishing is an interesting thing. You go to an area where you think there is fish, and then you drop your line, and then you pick from that particular area. And I, an example is right from Singapore. Uh, the architect himself says, uh, says that the inspiration for the Duxton uh, Pinnacle at Duxton Public Housing at uh, Tanjung Paga was inspired by the data structures uh, that you find in the, in the movie Matrix. <clears throat> and so he fished for that, for that image. And to be sure, he could have fished for other images, equally good or bad for that matter. Another example is an annual ritual that many people uh, including those from Singapore, would make this pilgrimage to Milan Fair every year to fish for ideas on furniture and design. Next is hunting. You can hunt for ideas. You know roughly what you're after, and you go into an area where you think there is sufficient um, return on what you might, might find. An example of hunting for ideas is postmodern architecture, where in those few years, uh, architects like um, Philip Johnson in this case for the AT&T building, now the Sony building at Madison Avenue in uh, 
in New York City is inspired by historical references. There was a mad scramble to look for historical examples, uh, albeit in bits and pieces, to pull together uh, new ideas for modern architecture. Then you can farm for ideas. This by far is the most interesting and something that I'm still looking at. Because many of the analogies of farming for ideas uh, works really well. For example, uh, government funding is like fertilizers. Um, the, the trouble with fertilizer is that uh, it is good up to a certain amount beyond which it is actually deadly. <laughs> <coughs> example of, uh, of farming uh, can be found in the works of Zaha Hadid, for example, uh, the top line here where she produces a prolific uh, number of sketches and drawings with a characteristic uh, lines and flows and and that is translated into, uh, in this example here, uh, in, in, in the middle top line, um, the master plan for One North in Singapore. Some of you may not even realize that that is her biggest project in the world, uh, 200 hectares of a master plan. Um, and the first five buildings in Biopolis was by her, by her office. She cultivates those ideas. For years, she never had any contract except for all the drawings that she made. Another example um, would be from Frank Gehry, who sketches and builds this um, um, uh, organic-like uh, shapes and translates them into many, many buildings, not just Bilbao in this case, but many other examples. These, these designers and, and architects cultivate these ideas um, uh, Zaha Hadid, for example, has a range of uh, fashion accessories for Louis Vuitton. But I want to come to something far more profound and far more uh, interesting in some ways uh, than just these this three basic processes of mining for ideas. It's called emergence. Any of these three uh, examples are subjected to this cognitive process called emergence. Things, ideas do not get plucked out of the air in, in totality, in a fully formed uh, kind of way. And I'm going to share with you five of them, just five out of my collection of, of many scores, actually. The first concept of emergence is that there is no ready-made world. The world is not like a supermarket, it's not like a library, it's not highly organized, labeled, and all you need to do is to browse and pick up the right item. How many types of grass do you know? You can't beat the cow, because the cow knows exactly what grass to pick. How many types of snow do you know? The Eskimos... Um, safety and his survival in the cold winter day might in fact depend on the type of snow that he knows because he, is, he has to wax his skis according to the type of snow for the day. Is a tomato a vegetable or a fruit? These classifications are arbitrary at best. They are contextual, they are motivated they are relevant only for the time that we need them. And so you get botanists, you get uh, ge geographers who get obsessed with uh, over-classification, not because it is wrong, but because they need to and we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Concepts and categories are also not absolute. If you were to ask, uh, if you were to, to be asked in an exam today, and exams are, as you know, in uh, Singapore, uh, very sacred. Uh, how many planets are there in the solar system? And if you are from about 10 years out, 
you would have very confidently put 9 on your exam script and you would have got 0, kosong. Because in 2006, we lost a planet called Pluto. Why? Because the learned among us decided that the definition of a planet should be changed. And Pluto did not make it. <laughs> this thing happens all the time. So what we consider fact is sometimes premised on assumptions that are not stable. It's very disturbing talk, huh? I, I just realized. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> this this uh, little sketch here uh, got very famous, in fact, because it was a subject of uh, a heated philosophical debate as to whether an entity can have multiple existence. Here is a figure that if you label the part on the left a beak, it's a duck looking left. If you label it ears, it is a rabbit looking right. And the two are mutually exclusive. And so the philosophers had a field day uh, trying to figure out, you know, if this is the case, this can be applied to many, many things that if you label, if you start on the wrong foot, as it were, you could end up uh, making assumption about the world that is based on that first move of labeling something one way and take and leading you down the garden path of assuming uh, the rest of the diagram or the rest of the entity having, having qualities of, of, of an entity that is completely different from one that if you had labeled it differently. So seeing is not believing. Number four. Here is a real test. It's called the Gelman category test. The, 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 the cognitive uh, psychologists run this test in order to see how fast uh, 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 different demographic, different uh, types of people uh, react to categories. Okay? And so they would present three items and, um, and, and they would time how quickly uh, the subject would group two of the correct ones. The so-called correct uh, pair is the lorry and the, and the wheel. That is supposedly by statistical um, survey, the correct pair. And they time these things to the microsecond. I put this test to my uh, young son. At that time, he was three years old. He's in the audience now. He's 20-something. Um, and I was amazed that he thinks that the correct pair is the cat and the wheel. So I was intrigued and I asked him, I said, why do you say that? He said, well, they're both black. Now, categorical errors uh, can also be creative insights. What some people think, and it could be the majority thing, need not be right, as it were. Because you could group things differently and open up a completely different line of thought. And that's what is the basis of creative thinking. And finally, in this uh, set of uh, emergent ideas, the gestalt psychologists, some of you might have come across them, uh, try to explain uh, diagrams by reducing them to their simplest forms. And so a uh, diagram like, like this cross shape, they would try to explain it by saying, well, the simplest form is two intersecting rectangles. And so there's this huge debate about uh, how the mind tries to reduce everything to its simplest parts. But look at this. These are far more interesting. Uh, de decomposition of that simple shape. 
My favorite is the second from the left at the bottom here. Four chairs to describe the, the intersecting uh, rectangle. They are not the most efficient. In fact, there are a lot of redundancies in these things. But they are the more interesting uh, of why, why look for the most efficient when, uh, when interesting shapes and interesting decomposition is what might lead to creative ideas. I just want to close with something that I'm very passionate about, which is how do you create an environment for creative ideas. The studio, as uh, is shown here, um, has been the unquestioned um, environment for generating ideas in design schools, in architecture schools, but also in practice, in advertising, in architecture, in, um, <clears throat> in fashion studios, and so on. But the studio is actually, especially in um, institutions, a very wasteful place. They are places where rites of passage is uh, being tested. Projects are done to clear hurdles. It is like the moot court for training lawyers. You go from one project to the next in order to get your paperwork um, and then you go into practice. So it's like a training ground for, for practice. The studio is as if um, a rehearsal for, for, for practice. Now, if you look very carefully at what studios do, they are propositional in nature. The, the work of studios makes propositions about the future, or at least about the immediate future. And it's an active form of, uh, of, of proposition. I suggest that that is now not enough. You need the reflective, sorry, it got cut off up there, up there, up there says reflective. And you need something what, what I call representational. You cannot depend on just propositions after propositions. You, know, you cannot have, be, have designers just, just churning out things. You need to be able to package things. And this is where, in fact, uh, something like the TED conference comes in. Because the conference is actually a representational um, forum for ideas to be packaged together from what otherwise are individual um, attempts to put ideas together. The reflective propositional format is the museum, the modern museum, I want to stress, not the old warehousing type of museums. And there are many now. The London um, Design Museum is like that. The new Cooper Hewitt Museum in, um, in New York, the Museum of Modern Art, New York. There's a new uh, museum in Tel, in, in Tel Aviv, and so on. They are places where ideas are put in a format, they are curated for reflection. And then the library. The library is, I think, at a crossroad. It is, um, especially with digital formats, uh, an interesting uh, place, interesting facility for reflective and representational uh, forms. And so together, uh, these would form what I would call the culture of creative ideas. And you need all these four at the institutional, organizational, and personal level. That's, that's it for me today. Thanks.